We know that there are trends all over the internet and in skincare. And if you are a skin intellectual and you've been turning and learning your ingredient lists, you might notice that niacinamide, hyaluronic acid, and glycerin are in freaking everything. Cleansers, sunscreens, hydrators, serums, moisturizers. Why are these ingredients everywhere? We know that things like niacinamide and HA are good, but why are they in literally everything and is there too much of a good thing? This is a very interesting conversation and I think each of these ingredients deserves a video of their own, but it is true that we see these things almost everywhere. And let's start with glycerin, because I feel like that's something that a lot of people who aren't skin intellectuals are afraid of without realizing it's in food. It's actually quite sweet. Glycerin is a humectant. It's relatively inexpensive. It's actually that glycerol backbone that makes up triglycerides, which we can think of like fatty acids and fats as. And because of the way glycerin or glycerol is, it's very, very smooth on the skin. Skin. It helps with hydration. It works well with a lot of other ingredients, and it doesn't go bad or rancid at the same rate that other compounds can. And because of this, as well as its inexpensive price, but how great it is for our skin and our bodies, it's a really great thing to use in a lot of cosmetic formulations. And we normally find this a lot in moisturizers and in serums. Almost any moisturizer that you put on has glycerin. We always see it as like one of the first ingredients outside of water. But we also see it in things such as cleansers and toners, etc. Basically, if you are looking for hydration, if you are looking for something that can kind of bring water and moisture into the skin, glycerin is a great way to do so. And even in more mattifying products, we see it in there because it really helps to make up the base of a product. If you've ever kind of tried DIY soap making, a lot of those glycerin bases or glycerin soaps are just that. Glycerin that then different detergents are added to or something like lye, sodium hydroxide, and you know the process of saponification to actually get a cleansing action out of that. But glycerin or glycerol are things that people shouldn't fear, but a lot of people do. And a lot of people don't realize kind of what they are or how they work. Do I recommend eating it? No, don't eat your skincare. And in general, it can be a laxative, so it can cause a little diarrhea. <laughs> but there's a reason that it's in everything and it's because it is really good and it works. And of course, niacinamide, hyaluronic acid. Let's start with hyaluronic acid because again, a lot of people hear that and it's scary. An acid, that sounds like it's gonna burn my face. Well, most people don't realize that hyaluronic acid is made inside of our bodies. It is literally made in our connective tissue. Hyaluronic acid can help with wound healing. It can help to cushion our joints. And it's something that yes, can also be helpful in skincare. And it's because it is again, a humectant. It holds on to water or moisture. Now, some claims say that hyaluronic acid can hold like a thousand times its weight in water. Maybe in some rare cases, uh, but there are different molecular weights of hyaluronic acid. And a lot of the times that figure is usually a little bit closer to 50. Now, when you're looking at ingredient lists, you might not see hyaluronic acid every single time. You might see sodium hyaluronate or hyaluronate. This sodium hyaluronate is kind of like a cousin. It's the salt form of hyaluronic acid, but it works very similarly and it's very easy to formulate with too. Well, this glycosaminoglycan is in, again, just about everything. We normally see it in hydrating products, but you'll even see it in sunscreens and yes, in some cleansers. Hyaluronic acid again comes in multiple forms, but you usually see it as hyaluronic acid and sodium hyaluronate, and especially in moisturizers, in serums, in toners, in anything really. It's almost always there, surefire. Even if it's in small amounts at the very end of an ingredients list, it can actually boost up even things like masks or even some exfoliant products have it in there. It plays relatively well with others, again, as long as there is water in the formula. And there are some instances where hyaluronic acid can dry out skin. We've done videos on that before, which I will definitely leave there for you. But as long as you're pairing hyaluronic acid with a humectant, again, like that glycerin and water, it should be totally fine. And especially if you are in a climate that is a little bit more humid, it's going to lend that moisture really well to binding with hyaluronic acid. But of course, we can't go without speaking about niacinamide. This is probably one of the most popular and people love it. This B vitamin is everywhere and so is its sister panthenol and biotin. But niacinamide, which is related to niacin, which can cause irritation on the face, is this gentle form that is actually loved in skincare. And it's very well studied. We know that when we use it in the skin, it can help increase ceramide production, so helping our skin make more ceramides naturally. It's because of this that it can help regulate oil control and things of that nature. And we also know that it helps with hyperpigmentation, with redness in the skin, with flushing. And it's because it stops that pigment that is created in our melanocytes, the melanin, stops it from spreading to our other cells, such as keratin 
keratinocytes. It kind of keeps it all in one place. But why is niacinamide in freaking everything? Why is it in sunscreen? Why do we see it even in cleansers? Niacinamide is one of those ingredients that, uh, from what I've read and from my understanding, it does work best when it actually stays on the skin. So putting that in a cleanser, eh, could help, but it's not like revolutionary. But anything that stays on the skin, like a toner, a serum, a moisturizer, and yes, even sunscreen is going to be a slam dunk. There were actually studies done on sunscreens with and without niacinamide, and the sunscreens that had the niacinamide in it actually performed better. Now, we know that adding like a vitamin C under a sunscreen can really boost up its efficacy with those antioxidants, but niacinamide and sunscreens play amazing. And because of the data that we've seen, there are a lot of sunscreens that just include niacinamide into those formulas automatically. And also, you know, the sun can cause redness and flushing and hyperpigmentation. And again, niacinamide prevents against that, which is why it's a really great ingredient and that we do see it everywhere. Now, niacinamide concentrations of like two to 5% are totally fine. You can find things like my favorites from The Ordinary that are over 10%. You can find other brands that have 12 or even 15 or Paula's Choice. They have like, I think they have like what, a 10 or a 20? More doesn't always mean better, and in the case of The Ordinary's 100% niacinamide, that was not a hit for me. Yes, it's water-soluble and I diluted it, but it actually caused some irritation on my skin. But low levels of niacinamide are at or around 2% are actually best for barrier support, and then concentrations of like 2, 3, all the way up to 5% are really good for discoloration and for hyperpigmentation. And knowing what you're trying to do, what your goal is with your skin, can help you look for formulas that have that right amount or that therapeutic benefit for you and your routine. But because niacinamide helps with so many things and because it does help with barrier support, it is in so many of these products. And that takes us to this question of, Glycerin, sodium hyaluronate, niacinamide, are these overhyped? Are they in everything? When we layer them or stack them, are we adding more and more and more? And is it really a good idea? Well, remember that more isn't always better. And this is why it is kind of important to make sure that we are being selective with our products. And we know how our toner is going to interact with the moisturizer that we put on, that's going to interact with the sunscreen that we're using to protect our face every day. We don't want formulas that have niacinamide to pill or to ball up, or sodium hyaluronate to cause dryness or irritation if we're in the wrong climate. Now, I know that can be stressful, but that's why you are a skin intellectual learning these things. That's why it's important to learn and understand ingredients, to try things out, but also to remember to take things a step at a time. You don't have to go everything in all at once. And if you're someone who used a high concentration of an ingredient list that had niacinamide, and you see another product that has a high concentration and it irritates you, you can start to look for that and say, oh, maybe high concentrations of this ingredient aren't great for me. And when in doubt, ask the experts. Go to a doctor or dermatologist, ask an esthetician, even go into a chat group with other skin intellectuals or biologists or chemists or people who understand these things and have the opportunity to ask those questions. I know that not everybody who cares about skincare wants to do that research. There are two types of people, especially in clinic. Some say, what is this? Tell me what to do about it. Just give me the answers. And then the other subset says, I want to understand why, how this works, what is happening and what can I do about it? And I am personally a little bit more like the second type and I think you are too. That's why you clicked on this video. That's why you save it to a watch later playlist. That's why you share it. That's why you care. And for those who do just want that quick answer, it can be overwhelming. But maybe through learning a little bit of this, you could actually be that person for someone else who does care and who can help inspire that curiosity or just pass this along to somebody else. And again, is it hype? Is it actually helpful? These ingredients are helpful, but anything can be overhyped. Thankfully, there's actually research to back these things up. And I think that that even brings us into a deeper conversation when it comes to skincare about hyped or trendy things being super sold out and then tanking. But when you actually have sound data, sound research, years or decades of studies and anecdotes and use of these ingredients in practice and they continue to work, it's no longer hype. It's more of a fact or it's more just helpful. And sometimes these things do have kind of trend waves that they go through. But when you have something that's awesome and always there, think of water, air, earth. All these things are kind of basic elements of life, and all of these ingredients are kind of basic elements of skincare. So whether or not they're being spoken about or hyped up during that one current climate or that one current season, at the end of the day, if we're supporting and protecting our skin, we're going to be able to allow it to do what it does best and just give it those helping hands that are proven by science instead of this new, you know, magical miracle elixir magic berry from the Himalayan Alps that was, you know, 
curb stomped by a alpaca. I'm sure those berries are very expensive, but tell me why they're better than niacinamide, okay? Okay. <laughs> always remember to stay hydrated both topically and orally, reapply that SPF, and always be beautiful both inside and out. I love you and I cannot wait to see you in this next video. <laughs> love you guys. Bye.